beautiful human. Welcome back to A Cult of Misfits. I'm Matt Owens. Today I want to talk about mind traps. These thoughts and beliefs that ensnare us. I want to talk about getting cheat codes to the cosmic escape room. I want to talk about how you're exactly where you need to be. But before we dive into that, let me just remind you that you can find A Cult of Misfits on YouTube and Instagram and Spotify. Guys, I'm everywhere. So if you're interested in things like esoteric wisdom, inner transformation, the nature of reality, consciousness itself, interdimensional beings, and maybe even lizard people, if any of those things interest you, (laughs) as they do me, then check out my podcast. Check out my other episodes. In the last one, I talked about the yugas, the ancient Indian Hindu belief in these grand cycles that we find ourselves in, these cosmic, universal, galactic cycles, not just in the macro, but in the micro as well, in our own lives, in our own civilization, on our own planet. Very interesting stuff. So that's what I've been diving into this week. If you're interested in that sort of thing, check it out. Let's talk about mind traps. I was taking my walk today and realizing that I have escaped from many mind traps. Let me talk about what that means. I feel like we consider ourselves in the matrix. Many of us do. I did. I'm including myself in that, where I'm in the matrix, or there's lots of religions and philosophies that talk about how we're trapped on this world or we're stuck, whether it's Yaldabaoth or uh, the Demiurge that has trapped us here or, uh, you know, <laughs> aliens or interdimensional beings of some sort that have uh, lured us here and and trapped us so they can take our gold and enslave us, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> I started thinking about, um, am I actually in a trap? Am I actually in a prison right now? And as a part of this spiritual journey I've had over the last couple of years, I realized that it's a prison of my own making, that as the ancient wisdom says, everything is of the mind. Literally, reality itself, everything that occurs comes from our mind. So if that's the case, then this whole illusion of being in a prison is simply what I've chosen to believe. And these are the traps. The traps are our thoughts and our beliefs because we tend to latch onto them. And then they become a part of who we are, who we think we are, I'm on this side of the aisle or that side of the aisle. I'm Democrat. I'm Republican. I'm the good guy. You're the bad guy. Those guys are the bad guys. We don't like them. I only like my, you know, it just starts getting into that sort of stuff. These are all the mind traps that I'm talking about. Or these fears that we have, these limiting beliefs that we have, these stories, this programming that we tell ourselves over and over again. Victimhood is one of the the largest mind traps for me, at least saying, well, I'm this way because my parents didn't do that to me or did that too much or because society, you know, brainwashed me. That's why I'm this way or blaming other people, right? I definitely went through that. (laughs) I had a lot of victimhood going on. That's just a trap. I've trapped myself in that. And the way that I freed myself from victimhood was realize that it's all just stories that I've decided to believe in my mind. So what I did was I just stopped believing those stories. <laughs> this, of course, took time. It didn't happen overnight. It was a lot of hard work and a lot of, uh, you know, mental exercise to, to do this. But um, practicing escaping from the cell of victimhood. That was a big one for me. You know, just this idea that they're the bad guys, they're evil. So easy for us to do as humans, and I've learned to detach myself from it. I talk a lot about duality and detaching myself from duality because there's freedom in detaching ourselves from duality. I've been diving into the uh, the Vedic scriptures, uh, you know, the ancient Indian uh, wisdom that Hinduism is based upon. Um, I just sort of just scratching the surface. I'm, I'm not ready to dive into it yet, but I don't know that much about Hinduism, just sort of surface level stuff. And I kind of want to dive in. Um, I've sort of gone through 
early Christianity. I grew up a Christian and a Gnosticism and a Rosicrucianism and a, you know, uh, just Hermeticism, all these things. Right. But I, but Hinduism is kind of a big, like I'll deal with that later. It seems like it's, it's big, it's a lot, it's deep. And I, I want to give it the time and attention that it deserves. And, so I'm just sort of scratching the surface on Hinduism. That's why in the last episode I was talking about the yugas, these grand cycles. But um, I found in my own research, just from my own knowledge, my own gnosis, <clears throat> the commonalities between all of these ancient philosophies and religions across the world. And when you go back far enough, theoretically, they weren't talking to each other. So I find it very interesting when there's commonalities between these philosophies. <clears throat> like the Great Flood, like I often talk about, but also the commonality that goes across many, 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 if not almost all of the ancient philosophies, is that we are in some type of illusion, a simulation, a matrix, whatever floats your boat. When I first started hearing about simulation theory by a bunch of, you know, these Silicon Valley tech tech media people um, talking about simulation theory. I was like, okay, that's a fun idea, I guess. And I started diving into it. I'm, I say it sarcastically, but it, I did find it interesting. <laughs> I don't know why I said it sarcastically. Um, but I thought it was sort of a new, new-ish idea. But as I started diving into these ancient philosophies, like Buddhism and Hinduism and early Christianity and the ancient Greeks with Plato and Plato's cave and the Egyptians and all of these philosophies, they all talk about how this place is not what we think it is, how it's not the quote-unquote real reality, right? Base reality, that this is some sort of an illusionary place. Um, the only reason why it has substance is because we believe it, it, it has material substance, right? Because our, our five senses are built to tell our brain that we are touching something or smelling something or seeing something, but I believe it's all a grand illusion. If it was just a bunch of tech guys from Silicon Valley telling it to me, I'd be like, well, yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's kind of weird, but maybe. But then when I start looking at all of the ancient stuff in combination with what, you know, the, the cutting edge of, you know, quantum mechanics and quantum physics and all the stuff that, you know, mathematics that, that I certainly can't comprehend that, you know, 99.99% .99 of the population can't comprehend, um, this stuff that we're just sort of scratching the surface on as a, as a species um, they all sort of talk about how this is grand illusion. So I, I've really been trying to digest that and think like, okay, if this is a grand illusion, if this is just the matrix, what, what does that mean for me? What am I supposed to do with that information? Um, and so I've chosen to view it as a game of sorts, right? An experience even. I just keep calling it experience. I don't attach words like a good experience or bad experience. When, when you use the words like prison planet or we're imprisoned or, uh, you know, the, the, the Nephilim or <laughs> these demons or demonic forces are running the government and running the world. And that puts, that puts me into a place of duality. That puts me into a place of they're evil. They're the bad guys. They're trying to put their boot on their neck. They are ruining society. They are the bad guys, right? And so I try to escape from that dualistic thinking because that's what the ancient knowledge tells me to do. And I, uh, to, to the best of my abilities, I, I've been trying to apply what the ancient knowledge tells me to do, suggests that I do, um, with great results. That's why we talk about these things out loud, is to share my experience, to share like, yeah, you know what? They were onto something. <laughs> these Egyptians, these Mesopotamians, these hermetic principles, they, they really, they, they're actually onto something there. And that's why I talk about it. Because I do feel like it's genuinely cheat codes to this grand cosmic game that we found ourselves in. That there's this hidden secret knowledge. That's what esoteric means. Secret hidden knowledge that's meant for the few, not for the masses. It's meant for those with eyes to see and ears to hear. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and so rather than viewing it as 
um, causing me suffering and this place sucks and I can't wait to get to new earth and 5d. And that's, that's me trying to project into a, f- a future that's not here yet. The ancients have told me to stay in the now. And so I'm going to sit my buns down and stay in the now. This place is fantastic. Love where I'm at. Thank you. I believe that we're advancing to higher levels of consciousness, higher levels of whatever the heck you want to call it. Our spirit is advancing, is growing, expanding eternally, I believe. And so I believe that there are level ups where we reach a certain level up. Just like in a video game, right? And I believe that my higher self, my soul or my spirit or whatever it is that that can see everything that I can't see within my human avatar, my human form, down here in the material realm. Hi, from down here. Postcards from the heaven, from the, from the 3D realm. Um, I don't know how you get mail to the heavenly realms, but that's what I'm looking into next. Hopefully there's some YouTube t- tutorials that can, that can walk me through sending a postcard to my higher self, but uh, I'm not there yet. Uh, I believe that my higher self is the video game player and I'm the video game avatar. And so I believe there's a connection there and I believe that it's in my best interest, my higher self's best interest, that my life go a certain way as well and go easier and smoother as well. Because I believe that when it gets rocky for me, it gets rocky for him. (laughs) So I think that he is attempting to navigate me through my intuition, through my gut, through uh, these, you know downloads from heaven the that, that whisper in my ear uh, i believe it's the angels or my higher self or whatever i think it's all the same thing potentially but um is leading me and guiding me so i i i thought of it as an escape room today on my walk i i was trying to think of like i'm going through an escape room but i'm currently blindfolded <laughs> i'm heading into unknown territory often in my own life if you've followed me for any given amount of time i i i find great pleasure slash great pain from um diving off of cliffs metaphorically into the unknown facing my fears um in order to experience expansion of my soul (laughs) and so i feel like i'm i'm bumbling my way through this escape room panicking not knowing what's going on freaking out i'm scared all the time and i've learned to let go to embrace the darkness to embrace <clears throat> not being able to see with my human eyes and having faith and trust that uh, a higher hand is guiding me and leading me. And as I've learned to let go of certain things in my life, or if not uh, is everything in my life, as many things as I can, as often as I can, because I've found that as I release, things get easier and smoother. As I just go with that flow and let spirit guide me and lead me, things go easier. When I try to control things or try to make things work my way or the way that in the timeline that I think should happen, then it starts getting a little bumpy. (laughs) Then I start experiencing greater and greater suffering. And so I feel like I'm having faith and trust in a higher version of divinity to give me some of the cheat codes, right? To get through this escape room to get to the next level. And I think that humanity on a whole is doing the same thing. It's just slowly rising in consciousness as time goes on. These these cycles that these cosmic cycles that we go through in the universe, on this planet, in this galaxy, in this solar system, <laughs> in our minds, in our lives, right? <laughs> I think we're trying to get to higher and higher realms. And the ancient philosophies confirm that. That's where I'm sort of like, okay, okay that there are lower realms and there are higher realms. And I'm, I was just sort of playing with the idea of the veil getting thinner and thinner as you go up in the realms. I, I'm kind of playing with the idea, like in Norse mythology or the Tree of Life with Jewish uh, philosophies, um, the Kabbalistic type of thoughts um, about these different realms that are within the earth realm, right? That there's just like, like a nesting doll where there's just layer upon layer upon layer upon layer expanding outward. And so I start talking, you know, then I start thinking about the Anunnaki or the Nephilim or angels and demons and, um, you know, interdimensional beings and aliens and gods and all this stuff. And I'm like, how, how do they fit into all of this? And I, 
I think to a larger degree, we can't comprehend most of it <laughs> yet from our current position uh, in space and time. But um, I think that they may all be a part of our realm, these, these physical 3D things. Um, and I feel like we're in a bit of a bubble here, according to Gnostic tradition, um, sort of this pre-Christian idea that... Um, that the and, and this isn't just Gnostic. There's other ancient philosophies that sort of confirm this as well. That that the material world, the three D realm that we found ourselves in, is not real life, and it's not um, that it's that it's a mistake of sorts. That it's that there that we're in sort of this bubble or this firmament or whatever however you want to think about it. This matrix, if you will. Um, and I wonder if when we advance to the heavenly realms, I, I believe when we die, our soul um, is not judged in, a, in an Old Testament Yahweh, um, you know, damnation or heaven situation. But I think that our soul is judged based on where our consciousness is at at the time of our death, of our physical death in the 3D realm. And I think that at some point, I mean, the Egyptians talk about it, uh, just everybody kind of talks about it. <laughs> how there's some sort of a, a weighing of our soul. And if we go one way, then we go back down to the 3D realm because we still have lessons to learn. Or if we have learned the lessons that the 3D realm has needed to teach us, we advance to the heavenly realms. I don't think that it's uh, nothing. I don't think, I don't think it's a punishment to go to the lower realm. Uh, I just think that it's what your soul needs at, at that given time. And if you need to have multiple incarnations in the 3D material realm, then that's, that's what's needed. And when you're ready to advance, you're ready to advance. Um, so these last couple of years, I've just been learning to let go. Let the cosmic river take me where it needs to, right? Not fighting the current. I was on my walk today and I walked past a, a beautiful babbling brook. <laughs> and I noticed I, I was just meditating and I, I was just um, quietly listening and watching and observing. And... I saw this bubble floating towards me on the on the <laughs> water and the bubble got stuck by some twigs and wasn't moving. And the metaphor came to me that that's my life. Oftentimes I get stuck on these detours that I am choosing to perceive as a detour, as a bad thing, rather than saying I'm exactly where I need to be getting all huffy and puffy and crossing my arms and like, why am I not at my destination yet? Why do I not have the things that I want right now? Why am I over here when I want to be over there? And the, and spirit told me as I was watching this bubble on the water, spinning around in these twigs, how is, how it's not popping? I don't know, but uh, you know, divinity is keeping that bubble alive. <laughs> And I saw all these other bubbles going around the big bubble and, uh, you know, just debris kind of going around the bubble. And Spirit said, this is why we put you where we put you at any given moment. Because sometimes we need to put you over here because certain things need to pass you by. You need to let certain things go and let them flow down further along the river. You're done. Certain people, certain thoughts and beliefs need to go around you and move on. And I was like, wow, <laughs> okay, that's great. And, and when the time comes that the bubble needs to move further on down the stream, then it's going to move on further down the stream at the exact right time. Divine timing, like I always talk about. So I'm constantly being reminded, specifically this week, that's why we're talking about it, is that I'm always exactly where I need to be. 111 is that little wink and nod from the universe. I, that, that's the tattoo I have is 111. Um, I see it everywhere. And it's, it's just a constant reminder for me that I'm exactly where I need to be. Because I often need to be reminded of it. Less often than in the past. <laughs> because I've been telling myself it so often. That's what I do is I tell myself these things. I reprogram these beliefs in my mind. The old beliefs from the old system, the old versions of Matt Owens used to constantly say things like, I'm on the wrong path. I'm not doing it right. I'm screwing this all up. I'm a big idiot. I'm a big failure. I can't do anything right. That's the voice in my head. I call him Hal. Hal's constantly telling me that I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
And so I've been learning to rewrite that script with fresh, new, crispy words that remind me that I'm exactly where I need to be. And when Hal starts yakking about how I'm on the wrong path, I just say, yep, that, that, that. that's a cute story. You're a liar. I'm actually exactly where I need to be. Thanks, but no thanks. You can keep that nonsense. I don't need it today because I'm on the right path. I would often have family members uh, who are of a religious persuasion would often kindly <laughs> tell me that I'm on the wrong path because I'm not following Jesus or I'm not following their sets of beliefs or I'm doing it wrong. I'm, a, I'm sinning or I'm not doing it according to what their book says or their belief system is. And I would just smile and say, that's all right. I have a different belief system. I believe that God has told me I'm exactly where I need to be. There is no right and wrong path. Society may tell you you're on the wrong path. Your church may tell you you're on the wrong path. Your family or loved ones or mentors, they may tell you this. It's nonsense. That's their own fears. I had to realize that they're just projecting their own fears onto me. Because I used to be that way. I used to be religious, Christian. That's how I was raised. And I was very scared of going to hell. I was very scared of doing it wrong because if you screw up, that's an eternity of damnation. I don't want to fuck around with that. That's my issue with most world religions is there's an, a, a large element of fear. A component of, of fear if you don't comply with the rules and the laws of Yahweh or Allah or whoever it is that you, you worship or the or whatever your book says. And I'm not shaming or wagging my finger at anybody uh, who believes any of that. I'm just saying for me, that this is my perspective. I view it as, as fear-mongering. And I experienced that myself, being afraid of damnation. I had a large, uh, this just popped in my head, so I'll say it because I feel like it's meant to <laughs> come out, but um, I've, I, I've had a large fear uh, from early on in my life uh, around sexuality because I was always afraid to explore my sexuality for fear of going to hell. If you, if you have sex or you fuck around before you're married, God is gonna, God does not look on that kindly. You're definitely going into the fiery pits of hell. If you ever touch any genitalia, <laughs> unless your state or municipality says that you are married on a piece of paper, otherwise you're going to hell. So that scared me for a while and really, uh, goes deep <laughs> it, to, to such regard that I'm still working through it. Um, but I just felt like that's, that needed to be talked about because it's another, it's another mind trap. Just like we're talking about, it's another mind trap. This story that I've told myself and, and, and they're not easy, these mind traps to get out of. I, I don't by any means mean to suggest that it's like, Oh, just stop believing that <laughs> this stuff goes real deep. And that's where the real work comes, right? To tackle these things. It's real overwhelming to deal with all of my fears all at the same time, or to deal with all of these mind traps all at the same time. Um, and to the point where it becomes too much and I don't want to deal with it. And I bury my head in the sand and I'm just going to go back to the matrix because I don't want to deal with this shit. So for me, it worked best to address all of them systematically because I was in many, many cages and it was just about escaping from them one at a time to gain my freedom one lock at a time. And looking back now over the last two years, especially, I, I feel more free than I've ever felt in my entire freaking life. And that's what I've been manifesting. When I manifest things like a winning lottery ticket, <laughs> my current endeavor, just keeping you in the loop, um, I had to really ask myself, why do you want to win a lottery ticket? That was really spirit asking me, why do you, what, what's your motivation here? What's your intention behind wanting to win a lottery ticket? And I had to answer that question and really dig deep and answer it honestly. And um, it, it wasn't for the, it wasn't to be rich, to live the good life. Although of course that is a component of it. I, I am a human being, but, but the deeper, but the deeper foundation 
of that desire is complete freedom because money is an energy money is a tool money is a um is a way to maneuver through this reality and it it can provide freedom right the freedom to travel wherever you want the freedom to well i like have to explain to you what money does uh I'm, i'm looking for freedom and so the larger thing that i'm manifesting over the last two years specifically has been freedom that encompasses financial freedom but that's not what i was focusing on financial freedom is a component of it but also freedom from my own fears freedom from my own anxiety freedom from my own stress right freedom from all of these things that kept triggering me and pissing me off and setting me off and ruining my day and ruining my week and keeping me down and um they're all just mind traps <laughs> They're all just mind traps. Another mind trap this week that I've been dealing with, not that sounds dramatic. I hadn't been dealing with it. It was actually not even a big one. I was thinking about, I, I was doing looking at the analytics for my podcast, as one does. Um, so shout out to everybody who's listening to the podcast. I'm I'm really enjoying having these conversations and I'm really enjoying um, just, you know, peeking behind the curtain a little bit and seeing um i can't see individuals of course but i i can see what countries you're listening from and i don't know how many of you are bots but shout out to the bots shout out to the humans shout out to the <laughs> reptilians and anunnaki and whoever's tuning in um but i'm really enjoying these conversations so thank you for joining me i appreciate your your support and your interest and um and having these conversations because i i feel like they're important to have and these conversations are not for everybody and so one of the mind traps that i got myself into was um how saying uh, <clears throat> have you noticed how we don't have that many instagram followers or podcast followers or social media followers and I, and I've learned over the last two years not to get into that trap. I've learned to step out of that trap. So anytime I, anytime it comes around again, like, hey, we don't have a, as many followers as we'd like, I say, uh-uh, uh-uh, I, I don't play that game. No, no thank you, Hal. I appreciate the effort. I mean, it was a good try, valiant effort, but it's not going to work this time. Because I have the amount of followers that I'm meant to have today. And that's that. I'm exactly where I'm meant to be. The people who are listening to me are the people that are meant to be listening to me. Shout out to you. Hi. I see you. Love you. <laughs> because these messages that I talk about, these things that we talk about are not meant for everybody. They're not meant for the masses. I'm not meant to blow up. At least not right now. So wishing and hoping, oh, I wish I had more followers. I wish it were bigger. I wish all of these things is not appreciating the present, right? Appreciating the stepping stones that I'm currently on to the path of my dreams. <laughs> and so I have to remind myself that the specific analogy that came into my head was Jesus. Shout out to Jesus. You never find in the Bible Jesus once saying, I wish I had more disciples. I mean, you guys are cool and all, but like, man, if I had hundreds or thousands or wow, even if I had millions, how great would that be? You never find Jesus saying that, do you? Because he was an enlightened SOB, guys. <laughs> that guy knew what was up. He knew that the amount of followers he had was the amount of followers he had. He knew that the vast majority of the people in his community were religious people, deeply religious people, the uh, it was it was a mostly Jewish population around him. I was trying to bring out the the two different sects of the the Jewish population at the time was the uh, oh it's rather right tip my tongue guys not a theo not a not a theologian so that's it'll come to me it'll come to me um, but Jesus had a small group of followers right because that's how it was meant to be. The messages that he was delivering, especially when you look at the 
the, the ancient texts that were left out of the Bible that are part of the Nag Hammadi library. If you're interested, look into that, the, the ancient texts that were left out of the Bible and the reasons why they're left out of the Bible. It's all very fascinating, but it, it paints a much grander picture of Jesus and his philosophies and his teachings when you look at the entire collection of works that the ancient Gnostics, I keep saying ancient, they actually weren't that ancient. That was around 100 AD, but a long time ago, the Gnostics, uh, these were sort of their sacred texts. Um, they got left out of the Bible. <sighs> And so you see this grander picture of Jesus just saying, you know, none of that stuff matters. Things of the flesh, things of the ego, things that your mind is telling you, the reptilian part of your mind, right? So I have to remind myself of these things when my mind or how starts telling me that I'm not where I need to be or I don't have enough followers or I'm doing it wrong or I dismiss all of those things. And I just smile and I say, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this moment in time. Thank you for the lessons to be learned. Thank you for this experience. Thank you for the rocky and bumpy moments. Because they make me stronger. I've been, I've been looking into this Hinduism like I talk about, and it talks about, you know, escaping from the cycle of reincarnation. The Buddhists talk about it. So it's kind of a, I, I think it's a, a thing, <laughs> this cycle of reincarnation. And according to the Hindus, they, they talk about how um, there are several paths or yogas to escape the material realm of reincarnation cycle. Um there's so many terms that I kind of get them all muddled up in my head. So we'll just keep it basic since I haven't really dove in yet and started memorizing these things. But, um, you know, in many of these ancient cultures, they all sort of talk about the same thing. That's why I kind of keep it general. It's because it's all sort of a general broad idea. They all talk about the same stuff, but, um, uh, what was I saying? Enlightenment, um, it's just sort of this ever unfolding thing. So as we, as we advance to the different realms, um, Oh, well, I'm kind of jumping all over the place here, but I, but I wanted to talk about that, the tree of life earlier and, and the, the Nordic, uh, you know, nesting doll scenario. I wonder if all of that is within the veil, even when we get to the heavenly realms, I was thinking about like, maybe they still don't truly have all the answers from the heavenly realms. Uh, maybe they, that maybe there's still some that is, that is veiled. And part of this expansion process is, uh, is part of the puzzle. Right? Maybe there's just this grand puzzle that we keep um, advancing into deeper and deeper uh, into knowing ourselves and knowing the divinity within and becoming closer and closer to it and lessening the perceived separation from the all that is. I don't think that there's God in the Christian sense. Uh, or the Abrahamic sense. I, I think that um, there are beings that are higher than us that we would perceive as gods, as mere humans, perhaps, that have powers and abilities and technologies that we can't comprehend. And so, of course, we would call them deities or divine beings or something that we just don't understand. Just like our ancestors trying to describe things like angels or um you know, these fire chariots or, uh, you know, beings coming from the skies or beings coming from the water. Like, are they aliens? Are they divine beings? Are they um, future versions of us? Like, you know, nobody knows. <laughs> but I think that there is a higher force, a higher power that that um, is interwoven in the all that is. And to me, that's God. And, and even calling it God is not, I think it's beyond our comprehension. It's beyond our language. It's beyond our understanding. Um, it is, it's even calling it consciousness or calling it the all that is, is it doesn't even scratch the surface or begin to explain what I'm, we're talking about here. So that for me is God in a way, the, the mechanisms of the all that is, uh, leading me and guiding me uh, with the help of its emanations that we call God or gods or angels or demons. I think that everything, including the, the angels down to the blade of grass to the stars above, are all emanations of the all that is. And according to the Hinduists, going back to the Hinduism talk, um, everything is one. Part one of these, there are several paths to experiencing this enlightenment or nirvana, and one of the paths is knowledge, right? Gnosis, just like the ancients talk about, uh, uh, gaining this this esoteric wisdom and knowledge, um, seeing things as they truly are, 
having the scales the scales fall from your eyes as you metamorphosize <laughs> and transform you start to see things differently that's one path of liberation another path of liberation um hmm. oh is is recognizing that re recognizing the illusion the illusion being duality that there is no duality there is just the one the everything the all that is we have no enemies. There are no evil and non-evil. It's all me. It's all you. It's all we. It's all us. It's all the one. And so one path of liberation is recognizing that. And it's one thing to recognize it intellectually, like, okay, hippie, I get it. Like, we are all one, you know, Mother Nature, blah, blah, blah. But it's about really integrating that knowledge really marinating in it and, and, and realizing what that means. And for me, that was facilitated by various um, <laughs> mind-altering medicines uh, that helped me to, uh, to open my third eye, to open my heart, to see things with this new perspective. But one path of liberation is recognizing that we are all one. And so... Part of that liberation for me, part of escaping from that mind trap for me, was recognizing that I have no enemies. Even the people who piss me off or give me the middle finger in traffic or uh, are grumpy at the grocery store or whatever the case may be, they're all just emanations of the all that is. That's what Jesus was talking about, loving everybody, everything, including Mother Earth. And not just loving everything on the external, but perhaps even more importantly, loving everything on the internal. That's the inward journey. That's the real path for me. That's the, that's the path through the eye of the needle that most people aren't willing or able to do. That path within is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> but for those of us, when we reach this level, maybe maybe not everybody reaches this level. Um, but I but I think that I think this is just part of the path of enlightenment is recognizing, okay, I see what's going on here. Everything on the external is a reflection of everything on the internal, literally and figuratively. I think that this weird earthly 3D material realm that we've found ourselves in is a reflection of that that is without on the other side of the veil. As above, so below. Everything is just so reciprocal and cyclical and it's beautiful when you start seeing it for what it is. And I, see, I say this like I'm at the top of the mountaintop. There is so much that is obscured from me, from my own perspectives and my own filters that I have as, as, a, as this human avatar. But for me, it's about stripping away all of those things and getting down to my core essence and communing with the all that is. That's what meditating is for me, too, is just quieting my mind and just being. It feels so good. It took a lot of practice for me to just be, right? Because at first I was like, yeah, okay. I get it, Kung Fu master, like, oh, just be, okay. Um, but I've really started to embody that. Meditation has helped with that. Just to sit and be quiet. To not try to control something. Just be the observer. Just let it be. Yeah, but there's chaos going around me, and can't you see that this, I got this fire burning over here, and this fire burning over here, and I'm kind of freaking out right now. And you're telling me to just chill out and just be like, I'm, this is a hot mess around here. You know, like we start freaking out about things that happen in our lives. Rather than just trusting and having faith that it's all working out perfectly. Even though it doesn't appear that way because of the stories or beliefs in our mind or what we can see with our human eyes or what it appears to be or people around us are telling us certain things about our life. That's all right. I've learned to say that's okay. That's your perspective. And, and you're free to keep it over there. <laughs> I didn't ask for it, but thank, thank you kindly. <laughs> 
but just accepting things for what they are, right? Not trying to control things. This is how I've gained freedom in my life. This is how I've gained so much freedom in my life is by letting go, detaching myself from things. I feel like a, a part of me wants to latch on to a belief system or a religion just to say like, oh yeah, I believe this. I'm Buddhist. I believe this. I'm Rosicrucian. I believe this. I'm Christian. But this process of letting go and detachment, I found myself just sort of blowing in the wind. And sometimes I believe this, sometimes I believe that, but I don't attach myself to it. And I've rather than regret that situation and say like, oh, I wish I just had something to attach to. I have to be reminded by spirit that the whole point of this whole thing is not to be attached to these things because that is what causes uh, frustration and complications in my life. Because then when I start attaching to a certain belief system or a certain religion or a certain God, then it starts turning in, then, then the human in me kicks in again. And I'm like, yeah, you guys are wrong. I'm right. You guys are idiots. I have the, I know the, I know the right way, the true way. My God is the one true God. Yours is the fake God. Sorry to tell you. Uh, then I start attaching to it. Then I start playing that dualistic game again. And so I like to be loose in the saddle now. Because that's where freedom is for me. End transmission. <laughs>